Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you around the globe. Today's webinar is about water chemistry, water quality analytics in power plants and industrial steam plants. So we are happy today to have you all with us and with me. My name is Uwe Wagner. Uh, I'm the moderator today. So please, if you have any question, put them and place them in the chat at the end of the presentation, we have ample time to go in discussion and answer uh, your questions. So again, my name is Uwe Wagner. I'm the Global Industry Manager at Andresen Hauser um, Group Services and responsible for the industry power and energy. With me in the background is Oliver Seifert. Uh, uh, he is Head of uh, Strategic Product Management, Vortex and Thermal Mass Flow Meters. And the presentation today will be given by Ganeshan Haterville. And please, Ganeshan, could you please introduce yourself? Thank you, Uwe. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ganeshan, working in Anderson Osar Dubai office, taking care of the, and the business development manager for analysis business. Okay, so, uh, first, I express thank you very much for the Global Power Industry team to having me here to present the topic, water chemistry, means water quality analysis in power plants and industrial steam plant. Yeah. So it's a, it's a very nice, interesting topic. Definitely, I, I'm sure you will be enjoying for next 45 minutes with the new information and what is the chemistry behind in the water across the steam and the water cycle All right okay let's let's move forward that fine so let's let's start with uh, what is the brain factors which decides the life cycles of power plants and industrial steam plants right so if you if you look the picture here the majority things starting with boiler design and the material selection, you know, what kind of, of course, this is the main brine factor, right? So, so that is one of the key things. The second one, we need to always keep in mind whether associated systems and applications across the, which are supporting structure for the main boiler, is it rightly chosen for the size of the boiler and what kind of steam you need, you know, all these things. This is also second brine factors of the life cycle. And the third one, the preventive maintenance. Yeah. So how good the preventive maintenance we are uh, going to undertake for the boiler is going to decide for the, the life cycle. Yeah? And the uh, last but not the least, the boiler water quality is also the one of the brine factors to deciding the water quality. So this is the topic we are going to talk today in the entire 40 minutes. What kind of chemistry behind this water, from where we are getting this water, why we need to maintain this chemistry from the, you know, from the starting to end. Uh, this is what we'll be covering the next 40, 45 minutes. Huh? Okay, look into this, we all know that. The water is key for producing the steam or producing the power, right? So from where we are getting this water? Uh, if you look here, there are five key sources of water. Yeah? But if you look, the estimation of the global water distribution by sources, it says about two third of the, the global water source is from the seawater. Yeah? 95 to 96 percent of the water is from sea and rest only four to five percent is coming from the the other four sources what you see here the rainwater surface water snow water underground water and again this is complete cycle you see whatever the surface whether it is a sea or whatever the surface waters are there it's getting evaporated and the condensation happens then then it comes in the rain form then again it is a cycle right so now the question is can we use 
the water as it is for my boiler. Yeah, we have 95 to 96 percent of the the sources from the sea. Can we use as it is, or can I get use the rainwater is whatever available I can collect? Can I use this water? So no, right? The answer is no. We can't. So now, why we can't use the water as it is? Because if you look the the water bodies and impurities, pH, conductivity, TDS, turbidity, color, hardness, and bacteria, these are changing from source one source to other source. Yeah, it's not the same from the seawater and pond water or river, right? And moreover, we need to see that these open sources are exposed into the atmospheric air, which has 78% nitrogen and 31% oxygen. And there are based on the, you know, the pollutant where the, the sources are there. There will be a traces of salts, NOx, and etc. So many gases around that. Yeah. So these are basically the pollutant of these water bodies. So which means. Uh, if if you take any parameter, it is going to change from one source to other source. Like for example, in the right hand side, what you see here uh, as a pH scale, there's a rainwater. It's basically it is starting with 4.5 to 5.5 pH. Yeah? But when you see the clean rainwater, what is clean rainwater and rainwater? So where more acid condensed, like a industrial environments are there, the rainwater which is coming will be around 4.5 to 5.5 more acidic because it's bringing a lot of acidic things from the gases which is present in that particular region. Yeah, the clean water you have five to six, like if you say DM water has a seven and the sea water is between 7.5 to 8.5, the tap water which is we are consuming that it is normally around the eight pH, the lake water again if you see that it is depends it's between eight and nine so which means the water must be treated before feeding into the boilers yeah the treatment is very very essential to to carry out further steam production right so if you open the the boiler water chemistry book any book if you open that there are 10 to 12 key critical parameters mentioned to monitor the entire uh, water and steam cycle across the power plants or steam plants. Yeah, it's it's starting with the pH, conductivity, TDS, turbidity, chlorine, silica, sodium and phosphate, and ammonia and hydrogen, total ion. Right, but uh, keep in mind these. 10 to 12 parameters always is not necessary for all the boilers. Yeah, it it's depends on the size of the boiler. It changes. Yeah, the, for for example, if you go with a small boilers which is used in some uh, uh, hotels or in the uh, big residential complexes, so that, that's all small sizes. We don't need to think about you know silica, sodium, phosphate, all those components. There only the pH and conductivity does the job. Yeah. So that's the basic uh, parameters. Which mentioned we need basically the soft water yeah, for the boiler feeding, right? So, if you see that uh, how this water treat uh, the waters are treated before feeding into the boiler, uh, this slide shows clearly that there are several treatment processes. But in the left hand side, what you see, uh, we were talking about. Remember the the global position of the water. We have only four to five percent of the sources. Uh, coming from the river, lake, stream, pond, and underground. So these are the water normally goes through the traditional treatment. For here, you can see that uh, pretreatment areas. Then aeration will be there. There will be a, a flocculation and sedimentation. Then it gets into the oxidation process. Then filtration. Then finally, it is pumped into the plant. Right. So these are the the pretreatment or basic treatment when you take the water from these uh, five different sources. Then before feeding into the plant, we need to maintain certain parameter as well. For example, if you look here, when the water I'm extracting from the, the directly from the source, I need to know what is the pH, conductivity, turbidity, and color of this water, right? Unless I measure these basic four parameters, I cannot control my the treatment at inlet areas. Yeah. 
So without measuring, I cannot have the control. So which means here why I need to do these things because further I need to reduce these components like pH, I need to maintain turbidity, I need to maintain the TSS has to be maintained, right? So that's what uh, the outlet of this inlet control area, the aim is to monitor these three parameters at least, right? So like that, each and every step, we have certain parameter. However, the final water which is treated, it's again, it's not uh, recommended to use directly into the boiler. Even whether the boiler is small size or bigger size, this water will go through the RO plant or DM plant for further softening process. Then we need to meet the uh, uh, EPRI, you know, ASTME standard, which is uh, recommending certain kind of guidelines for the uh, feed water parameters. Yeah? Unless we get those parameters by adjusting with this uh, small DM plant and RO plant, we cannot feed into the uh, power plant or industrial steam plant. Right. So the same way uh, we need to think about what is the, if I use the other 95 to 96% of the global sources, which means it's the seawater, right? So when I take the seawater for my plant, so the different treatment process has to be followed when compared to the previous slide, right? So if you look the seawater intake area, uh, for example, the desalination process, right? So without desalination, I cannot consume the water to my uh, power or steam boiler. So now, if you look here, the seawater intake, always there will be a filter. Then the pump house, again, I need to monitor the same. You see here, it's there is no change. Turbidity, pH, temperature, conductivity, and TDS or the uh, you know, uh, default parameter. So once I know this, then I can take care of how much, what is the disinfection I have to do because the water is coming from the sea, lot of bacterial, fungus, these things are, will be there. We need to you know, uh, neutralize those components. So there will be a chlorination setup. Then once the chlorination is done, this is going to the flagellation and sedimentation area where I need to remove all the uh, uh, turbidities and bring down the turbidity and again, monitor the dechlorination things because before moving into the uh, desalination input, right? So once the, uh, the water is ready from the pretreatment to desalination area, desalination can be a three different process. Yeah, it's according to the region, according to the plant size, people will go at the MSF or MED or RU plant, right? So now once the desalination is done by one of these processes, then the water will taken into the remineralization plant, which takes care of what all the minerals required for the public. They add the mineralization here, then it's distributed to the public, right? The other way, the DM plant, which is, uh, uh, you know, the, the water which is coming from the desalination has to go through the DM plant to softening process. Then once the softening is done, then it's, get into the power plant after the power plant is put into back into the sea. Yeah. So again, you can see here some of the, which all the major parameters like turbidity, yeah, conductivity, chlorine. So th these are the key things in the, the water treatment areas. Yeah. So here, what we are going to do there, it's so Anderson Dosser, we have developed, you know, these kind of areas uh, going with bits and pieces with the small sensors and flow cells and transmitters separately it's going to be a you know, it's a, a nightmare for the contractor having this it's not a you know, flow meter just like I buy one flow meter and put it into the pipe cut the pipe and put this thing it's not going to be the scenario right so you need to have something how to assemble all these things together and I need to have very, uh, you know, uh, headache tree set up where I can connect the sample in and out. This is what we have developed a certain kind of guidelines with the water quality standard panels, which has combined some parameters. Sometimes it can be a separate uh, single parameter as well. Uh, you know, basically this is uh, uh, what it is going to help us. Uh, completely, we are going to reduce uh, your engineering cost, you know, installation cost, these are the things are uh, you know totally eliminated when you think about the standard panels for the intake areas. Yeah. 
So also we have, uh, though we have different setup, also we have developed a certain kind of, you know, this is called, uh, uh, we say that uh, back noir flow arrangements where in one small flow cell where you can have multiple sensors with a cleaning system. So if it is a seawater intake, the water can come here. So this capacity may be somewhere around 10 to 15 liter. So the sample is, you know, uh, comes here and goes. So always all the sensors are put inside the basin. So with a small compact arrangement, you will have all the sensors assembled in one basin and with a one transmitter, you are able to have the, all the required parameters at the pretreatment areas before feeding into the boilers, yeah? And now coming back into the segmentation of steam boilers, the chemistry changes, right? So what do you mean? It means, as, as, as I told, the 10 to 12 parameter is not the standard for all size of the boiler. It is going to change the, the according to the boiler size. If it is only, I'm going to have small boiler, yeah, which is a residential one, I don't need all those parameters. Only pH and conductivity is enough. I don't uh, need to monitor all the parameters here. So like if you take the commercial and institutional boilers, which are a little bigger than the residential one, the size wise. So here maybe I may need one or two extra arrangements. But when you think about industrial boilers and utility boilers, which are higher capacity around you know, 50 megawatts or uh, 100 megawatts above, then we need to think of the whole chemistry which I was describing there. Right. So that's what the chemistry is going to change according to your boiler size. It's not the fixed for the small boiler to big boiler. So always keep in mind, I don't need to measure all in the smaller boiler. At the same time, I have to follow all the parameters in the bigger size boilers. Right. Okay. So now uh, many people think about where, where do we use, how these plants looks like. Yeah. So to, to bring the, the real virtual tour, just I'm taking one picture here. Uh, just you see the, how the big power plants looks like that uh, combined with the desalination complex. Uh, if you see here, this is the water intake area where we draw the water, right? So there we, we saw this uh, certain kind of, you know, turbidity, chlorine, pH, conductivity, all these kind of parameters are measured to see the what is the raw water I'm getting from the sea. Then according to that parameters, what all the further steps I need to take care of that, that will happen in the pretreatment area. So once the pretreatment area is done, then it is fed into the desalination. So this desalination can be MSF, MED, or RO. What you see here in the picture, which is shown as a MSF plant, yeah, multi-stage flush. And you need to have some utilities set up to operate this plant. That's what you have boiler and steam turbines because though it is a gas-based uh, uh, turbine uh, plants, but you need a lot of steam. So you have auxiliary boiler with a steam and also the steam uh, turbo generator to start up the things, right? So that's what you see the one corner, there will be a boiler and STG. Then these are the areas mainly with the gas turbines and uh, uh, associated systems. Then we will have finally the water which is coming, um, uh, part of the things is fed into this uh, utility section, the boiler and STG, the other water goes to the remineralization plant where the required minerals are added. And from here, the water is fed into the public or the other industries who are buying this water from this source, right? Then you have the cooling tower. Yeah. So these are the areas you can think about where all this water chemistry is play a, a critical role in the power plants or combined with a desalination and power complex. Yeah. So now the same way, uh, if you think about some hydrocarbon sector for which a big chemical complex, for example, take a, uh, the bigger ethylene cracker, right? So you have big setup here as well, but still this plant is required a lot of steam, a lot of power. So how do we manage this steam and power? That's what we need to have small utility areas will be there. Uh, where we need a lot of water and the complete uh, steam and uh, power processes taken care of this part of this area where you can think of the uh, liquid analysis chemistry. 
right? Okay. Now, what can happen if water chemistry fails? Right? The answer is, you see here, sludge, corrosion, pitting, and scale. So these are the things are very, very dangerous for the pipelines and associated equipment. So if, if we are not treating the water properly, our chemistry is going to fail, then this is what's going to happen in the further areas. So it means, for example, if you see the 0.1 centimeter deposit can lead overheating of my boiler, or it can create the corrosion. And also because of these things, I need to accelerate my fuel consumption, which means five to 12% of excess fuel consumption is going to happen. So, and again, replacement or retrofitting is an unplanned OPEX, which is coming for such kind of scenarios, yeah. And think about secondary customers or affected and product quality also questionable because the boilers are not only used for production of the power, the steam consumption is uh, used in the different plants. For example, I explained in the chemical complex, there will be a lot of heat exchanger, there will be a crackers. Even if you take food, food and beverage industry, pharmaceutical, yeah? So their product is questionable because there they use a lot of steam for the process as well. If the quality is not maintained, then the product, yeah, the steam quality is directly linked with their product quality. This is what the important, we should not fail with the chemistry, water chemistry. So there are three things always we have to keep in mind to keep the sad operator to happy operator. We need to maintain good quality of feed water and monitoring and controlling of certain online chemical parameters, the proper chemical dosing. Yeah. So these are the three basic things we should always keep in mind for operating, whether it is a small or bigger size boilers. So for example, here you can see that uh, how the chemistry is changing again. Uh, the, the top one, what you see is the feed water parameters. Yeah. So these are the must monitored parameters when you see the pH, conductivity, silica, dissolved oxygen, hydrazine, and total ion. Uh, for example, look the pH. Here, when it's come 7.5 to 8.5, when the boiler pressure is around 40 bar. Yeah, so I do not to go a very high alkaline condition. Yeah, basically, we have to always keep the water in alkaline condition when it is coming as a feed water, right? So I don't need the higher alkaline condition, but when the pressure increases, you can see how this alkaline condition is increasing. Yeah. And same way you can see the conductivity. Yeah. Silica. Silica, if you look into this, uh, the what you see here, 20 to 40 PP, uh, ppb around here, 20 ppb, these are the things for the feed water. But the right hand side, you see the yellow color around 1000 ppb, around 200, 100. So this is for the boiler water. So there is a difference in the feed water and boiler water, right? Once the feed water is pumped, getting inside the boiler, then the high temperature and high pressure is happening, then additional chemistry required to be monitored, which is additionally, apart from the above six parameter, we need to monitor the phosphate, sodium, ammonia, and chloride as well. So that's what the chemistry is changing from place to place, and also it is changing from the size or, or what is the capacity of my boiler, right? This is going to decide the uh, chemistry of the feed water or steam. Okay. So now, if you look the complete processes, yeah? So from where, where it is starting, as an interesting hosser, we are offering two different kind of uh, uh, product portfolios for managing the complete uh, water cycle in the power plants. Uh, one is the sensor-based technology and the, another one is reagent-based wet chemical technologies. Because certain parameter we cannot have with the sensor-based technology. So which, which is, you can see that the top one pH, conductivity, TDS, dissolved oxygen, chlorine, turbidity, even TOC, Total organic carbon, we have come up with a sensor-based optical technologies and nitrate, 
Yeah? So these are the things are very simple uh, sensor-based technologies. But if you think on uh, wet chemical like silica, sodium, ammonium, phosphate, hydrazine, chlorides, and sometimes some samplers also coming into the picture. Yeah. So if, if you look here further, the pH, like it, it is mandatory to be controlled and monitored from the beginning, beginning where it starts from the boiler feed water, right? Then it comes and goes to the uh, feed water pump and deaerators, then it is fed into the boiler feed, right? So here the pH is important. Then again, the, the drum, once the steam is converted, the steam we have to monitor, and again, when it comes as a condensate, the pH has to be monitored. So, so if you see around four plus one, five, six, seven, eight places minimum, we need to monitor the, the pH. Yeah. Why we need to monitor the pH? Because in the entire hemistry here, the, the pipeline, the uh, water should not go into the acidic condition because it is the, the powerful killer for the uh, corrosion, right? So it's going to be create the corrosion. So we need to have always the alkaline condition in entire set road, right? Such way, if you look, there is a conductivity always hand in hand. Wherever you see most of the places, pH and conductivity comes together. Huh? Then apart from that, there are, you know, dissolved oxygen has to be monitored and uh, hydrogen is there. Then there will be a turbidity monitoring in at least in the feed water and the cooling uh, cooling tower circuit. Then there will be a TOC measurement in the cooling towers. And also you can think of silica analyzers for certain places, yeah? then sodium, ammonia, phosphate, chlorides. Then finally the sampler also we need for when the water we are taking place here, right? Okay, now coming back, uh, there is a link between, uh, many people ask me, why the, what is happening here what is doing this hydrogen what is oxygen right so if you look here always the oxygen hydrogen and ammonia this has the direct link why we are using oxy, uh, uh, oxygen measurement here because it is a, another second element to uh, cause the corrosion in the boiler the oxygen contents are more it will be creating the uh, corrosion in the pipe Right, so we need to reduce the oxygen content less than five or seven ppb like that. So that's what always the hydrogen is added here to reduce the oxygen content. Yeah, once the oxygen content is reduced, you know, well, oxygen content normally there are two processes you can reduce in the boiler. One is the chemical deaeration, and another one is the mechanical deaeration. Normally, the first phase is done always with the mechanical deaeration, which is happening in the deaerator. When you inject the steam and the water feed water goes, all the uh, oxygen contents are eliminated. But still, there will be a traces of uh, oxygen content carrying over through the feed water. So we need to further reduce that oxygen content. That's what we are using the hydrogen here. Always hydrogen is the oxygen scavenger. When you put the hydrogen inside, so it it's eliminates the oxygen content. But further, when it is moving with the water, it will develop little ammonia. Right? Why this ammonia? How it is helping? Because this ammonia also helps to boost the pH further. Because our aim is to keep the pH above, right? So this ammonia will help the increasing the pH in the feed water. And around 200 degree temperature, when once it is entered inside the boiler drum, because it's always high temperature, yeah? Feed water normally around 120 degree. When it reaches the drum around above 200 degree, this ammonia again, it is doing the favor for the boiler, right? Whatever the ammonia is generated by hydrogen, that ammonia will act with a hematite, you know, uh, layer of the boiler. It will be producing the another magnetite layer over the boiler drum. So what is this magnetite layer is doing? It is protecting the further corrosion or uh, happening to the main, the end uh, boiler surface, right? So it, it's forming the another layer to protect the corrosion. So these are the advantages. You know, it is always linked with ammonia, oxygen, and hydrogen things, right? So now the another one, how this, uh, uh, again, we have here phosphate, sodium, and chlorides. Okay. So here what is happening, uh, there will be a still lot of hard components like, you know, uh, 
magnesium, calcium, sodium things will be present in the water. Yeah? So when, when it is exposed into the drum, boiler drum atmosphere with a high temperature and a high pressure, these components, you know, it is forming like a rock. Yeah? So we, we should not be allowing this formation of the rock. So this rock formation has to be time to time. Uh, we need to convert and eliminate these things to avoid the uh, scale formation inside of the boiler. So that's what, you know, uh, many times sodium hydroxide yeah, or some of the uh, phosphate components are used to, to make soften this hot component into the sludge. That sludge is time to time, it is removed with a blowdown operation. So that's what you can see in the boilers, uh, continuous blowdown, CBD and IBDs, intermittent blowdown and con continuous blowdown, right? So, so time to time, you need to inject these chemicals and convert all this hard component into soft component in a sludge form. That sludge is eliminated through CBD and IBD process, right? So now still coming back another point, so this is what uh, forming the further phosphate and the sodium components, which has to be maintained and continuously monitored in online. And also how this uh, phosphate and sodium uh, or chlorides are carrying over to the further uh, superheater or turbine or after turbine, maybe the steam is used for the processes. Yeah. So what is happening there? So that process, what is happening? We all know that how critical the boiler drum level control. Yeah? So we think it's only for the level control. No, this level control is having the bigger role for maintaining the hemistry as well. If your boiler drum level is not properly maintained, whatever the killing component we are talking about, formation of phosphate, sodium, and chlorides, that will carry over through the steam. If level is not maintained, if it is always higher level, then automatically these components are carried over through the steam. Then it's getting into the superheater, then further elements, it goes and deposit and eat those components as well. Yeah. So that is the reason the drum level also having the crucial part of maintaining the chemistry in the boiler. Right? So once it is all done, then it's coming back to the condenser in the condenser outlet again because we use a lot of uh, you know the water probably in the seawater or some components then there will be a it's always uh, you know vacuum condition there is a chances of air ingress then it can create a uh, oxygen content you know uh, increase oxygen content in the condensate outlet so always the, the sodium breakthrough also has to be monitored in the condenser outlet so this is what you can see always the condenser outlet before we use uh, into the feed water, we need to monitor the dissolved oxygen, sodium, pH, and conductivity as a minimum parameter, right? So now, having said, if you look here, the feed water area and the cooling tower area, the elements are okay because the pressure and temperature normal condition, I can use, you know, the normal sensors and uh, there will not be a complex uh, sampling system required for these two areas. But when you think about feed water, you know, uh, superheated steam, saturated steam, uh, then condensate outlet. So we need to think about some complex sampling system because we are going to play with the high pressure and high temperature areas, right? So this is what, what you see here. Uh, as Anderson Dosser, we are supporting our customer for designing the complete SWAS panels. From the, the takeoff point to the analyzers, we take care of for all the engineering things. Yeah. So if you see the source panel, you have uh, the isolation valves, then you need to keep in mind that there should be a blowdown, continuous blowdown wall. Why the continuous blowdown wall is required? Because you need to maintain the always the velocity. Yeah. Why the velocity is required? The pipe has to be, we should not allow forming the sedimentation in the, the boiler, uh, means the takeoff point to the analyzer and the sampling inlet, the pipe has to be kept clear and we should not allow some, you know, surface coating or uh, uh, corrosion or scale formation. That's what uh, minimum six feet per second velocity has to be maintained throughout the sampling system. 
So why this velocity is maintained that uh, one side and the advantages I explained already, the other side we need to meet this lag time. So minimum, if for example, if you are going with a quarter inch tube from the sampling point in the boiler drum to the sam uh, analyzer sample inlet, if it is, for example, the 1,000 feet uh, pipeline, so we need to have 2.8 minute minimum on the lag time with a six feet per second velocity has to be maintained throughout the system. So in case if you are increasing the uh, pipeline size, then I need to increase proportionally my flow as well. That which means my this blowdown wall has to be kept open more and I have to increase the velocity by opening this blowdown wall, which is assuring me I am always getting the fresh sample for the analyzers, right? So, so the aim of this complete sampling system always, it should be, you know, the primary objective of the sampling system should be transport and condition the sample without altering the hemistry. So the parameter which are to be controlled, we always to think the sampling system to be designed for reducing the velocity, reducing the pressure and reducing the temperature. So that's what we take care of the sample coolers and there will be a thermal shut up wall for the further protection of the sensors and analyzers, you know, then pressure reducing and back pressure elements as well. So, so we follow as per the ASTM, ASME and EPRI guidelines and all the SWAS systems, we engineered ourselves and we are supporting to the customers across the globe. So when it comes Anders and Hauser, you know, we, we always keep with a different segment for the uh, different tires of the industries, right? So if you see in the SWAS, we have three different segments. One is a SWAS customized. The second one we can support with the SWAS Apex because most of the uh, boilers, uh, auxiliary boilers, which is supports for chemical complex or oil and gas industries, it has to be meet with some Apex uh, norms, right? So that's what uh, the complete Apex certified uh, uh, SWAS systems. Also, we deal with that, and we have SWAS compact. Majority of the time, this is used to for the uh, small boilers like uh, industrial type uh, pharmaceutical or uh, the, the capacity where it's uh, less than 20 times, something like that up to the low pressure, low temperature areas, you can think of this was compact. Yeah. So, so what, are, what is the major difference between this customized and uh, compact? The thing is here, we can go up to 320 bar and 570 degree temperature. And also this was customized is the uh, modular based to concept where you have different hemistry of the panels apart from the primary sampling system. Then we have the uh, hemistry one, like maybe pH or hemistry two, it is a combination of pH and conductivity and hemistry three can be a, a you know, a cationic conductivity. So uh, we have different module, like in the one, what you see in the last, it's a silica hemistry, right? So like we can add, it's an add-on concept just you need one preparation unit, then keep on adding the panel one, panel two, like this, according to your chemistry. But here, the, the compact is always coming with a fixed parameter. Yeah. So also, it is designed for low pressure and low temperature things. And some th sometime it is not mandatory. This has to be used for only for the uh, small industries. Even uh, you can think of this compact SWAS panel when you are using the bigger size SWAS in the power plant as well. Because your primary cooler and pressure reduction takes place here, always this secondary side, after this uh, pressure reducing element, the thermal setup wall, you can think of using that sample with the compact SWAS panels. Yeah. So basically this portion you can have in the, the field and the compact SWAS panel, you can keep it in the uh, secondary side of your uh, SWAS section. Yeah. So this is the combination also you can think of that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, another one, wet chemical analysis use case one. For example, you know, when you have sodium ion exchanger, anion outlet, you know, MB outlet, RO inlet and outlet, plant cooling water. Yeah, because here in the pressure and temperature is not too much, just uh, I need to just 
put one isolation valve and take the sample directly to my wet chemical analyzer modules, whether it can be a silica or sodium or phosphate or ammonia, right? So I don't need a complex sampling system here, just with the one small quaternions tube, I can draw the sample and fit into my analyzers. Yeah, so because it's, it's based on the, my pressure and temperature. But the same way, if I take the sample from boiler feed water or boiler drum or steam or condensate, what's happening here? These are very high pressure and high temperature area. So the sample must have to go through the sample handling system to reduce the velocity, pressure and temperature. So once the velocity and pressure temperatures are reduced, then I can take this sample into my wet chemical analyzer module. So this is the uh, use case two. You can think where your pressure and temperatures are high. So without sampling system, it's very difficult to manage the wet chemical analyzers. Okay. The, another example, uh, you know, the cation conductivity. So cation conductivity, we, we all know in the plant, it's all very, very low conductivity, like 0.2 microsiemens, 0.5 microsiemens, like that. Yeah. So uh, when when we visit many customers, they used to ask, uh, how, how do we calibrate this such a low range? Is there any possibility to check these things, right? So so you, you can think of now, you know, there is no way to get the, such a low calibration solution. And when you open the 0.2 microsiemens conductivity in atmosphere, immediately in the CO2 get inside, it's completely going to change the chemistry of the, I mean, the conductivity value of the solution. So that is not normally recommended. The recommended uh, methods, what we are uh, trying to help our customers, uh, you can think of having one master sensors and uh, one portable uh, battery powered compact uh, analyzer. Yeah. So here just you can have this setup always in your hand, just walk in through the plant, connect this sample outlet, which is normally in the drain, uh, disconnect that tube and connect it to your sample uh, flow cell, the inlet and outlet, monitor this. If this meter is reading 0.5 and online is reading 0.7, then believe this because this is certified unit, you can calibrate uh, with a laboratory and have a certification. Uh, uh, considering this as a master, you can calibrate the online meter. Yeah. So this is a very compact and uh, it's a new family member for Anderson Dosser, I would say that. It's uh, very lightweight, 155 gram. It can measure the five hemistry like pH, conductivity, uh, ORP, uh, dissolved oxygen, temperatures, so this kind of uh, five parameters it can basically cover. It's a battery powered with a five wattage and 48 hours, you know, uh, uh, the capacity, battery capacity. Also, it has a nice logbook and, uh, uh, you know, tag book as well. Also, you can, you know, the verification of power plants and utilities, the recommended methods, again, you can think of having one master instruments like that before doing the calibration always think of verification because there is a huge difference between the verification and calibration the ver doing the verification is easy just you know connecting these things and verifying with another master instrument right so where you are satisfied with the verification you don't need to go with the second step for the calibration so which means if a, if a power plant to think about, there are 27 measuring point in 300 megawatt boiler, you know, such uh, uh, 300 megawatt, there is a major plant which has around 10, 10 turbines like that, 10, uh, 300 megawatts, which means 270 analyzers. Think of that. If you are going to reduce your 50% time by eliminating the calibration because you are very satisfied with the verification, so you are completely avoiding the calibration. So once the 50% of the calibration is reduced, it's a direct cost saving for the, your OPEX. Right? And also think of degassed cation conductivity. Why the degassed cation conductivity is required? Because most of the time this degassed conductivity is required when the boiler went for longer time for the shutdown and you are starting or, or uh, you know, some uh, a breakdown happen when you are starting the boiler, then a lot of CO2 present in this. So to, to, to monitor this CO2 content, you know, this is also creating the issue on the conductivity measurement. 
so normally it goes through the when it goes through the cationic conductivity all the the chemical spices like you know ammonium and other things are absorbed but still the co2 presence it cannot be eliminated through the cationic changer so that's what this co2 has to be removed by the reboiler effect so when you heat up this uh, uh, sample then the co2s are eliminated then what you have the sample without co2 will give the clear conductivity without co2 interference yeah. so so we also have the degassed conductivity for the boiler startup operations and also think of you know automatic event based sampling for boilers and turbine what what it is doing uh, you know normally the lab people they goes and collect the sample coming back to the laboratory on morning it is a regular routine process we don't need this unless if you set up your event in your analyzer itself so this event can control my samplers so whenever the silica content is going high or ph is reducing below 9 it can give the command to the sampler and sampler can collect the sample and keep it for you yeah so this means uh, by avoiding the regular uh, things you can do the lab or cross certification by lab whenever the event is happening so such a configuration you can think of uh, you know monitoring the your cross verification with the laboratories also the water chemistry measurement in cooling water network is very crucial because this cooling water is distributing the things into the different part of the plant it is going to the uh, you, you know the the turbine areas or the pump cooling or it can go to the some auxiliary plants in and around the areas so when it is coming back it's bring lot of uh, there may be a chances of some hydrocarbon leakage or you know uh, organic carbon might have total organic carbon might have increased so this is also another important things to monitor always after when the sample is uh, in the cooling water leaving the cooling tower it has to be disinfected so you have to continuously monitor ph and chlorine and whenever it goes through the some heat exchangers it is recommended to monitor the conductivity at inlet and outlet then before putting back into the cooling tower always monitor the toc if it is within the permissible range then you can uh, uh, bring back into the cooling tower and do the treatment for the treatment yeah so the another uh, you know unforgetted the water chemistry in the uh, generator stator cooling you know the generator stator uh, alternator you know how much the heat it is generating so to cool down that generator we need a lot of plenty of water inside you know circulating in and around that uh, not the surrounding of the stator so here we need to always think about having different water not the normal one so always this package will have small deionizer then the deionizer will be pumping the water to the storage tank and before uh, you know circulating through the generator you know the rotor area Uh, it's very important to monitor ph because the corrosion and again dissolved oxygen again is the corrosion and conductivity we don't want to form any uh, salt formation inside that uh, stator uh, area so so these are the three basic measurements always you know you keep in mind when you are using the uh, water for generator stator cooling mechanism right and finally when the water coming from the condensate what is happening because before again we are it's a uh, the water is cycle before circulating through the feed water and again it is going back to the boiler turbine no this condensate outlet always has to be taken into the condensate polishing unit where we have certain guidelines to monitor the the crude or uh, reactive silica or sodium and you know sodium carryover breakthrough is a very important thing at the uh, condensate outlet then ph tds this all you can monitor and within that parameter you can control this then you can allow this water to recirculate into the feed water again and uh, finally we, we we all each one of us you know remember we are responsible for protecting our environment we all know that lot of waters are used in the power plant or any other industries as well and finally all these waters coming from you know different um, process water or run down water 
or sometime, sometime it is coming from the blowdown water. So these waters are just like that. We should not neglect and putting back into the sea. Yeah? Before that, it has to be monitored, properly treated. Then we need to throw this into the sea. So such a things, you know, you're also having the complete system is called WEMS water emission monitoring system before throwing into the sea or to the atmosphere you have to according to the local legislation you have to monitor certain parameter for example ph conductivity turbidity sac chlorine and oiling water yeah. so as a summary just uh, sorry for taking five minutes extra uh, as a summary i would like to conclude here Keep in mind sludge, corrosion, pitting, and scaling or the cancer to the plants. It is very difficult to control unless we take precaution or give the right chemo on time. So which means if you are thinking of reducing energy and increasing efficiency of our, our, our plant, think on water chemistry. Do not take any shortcuts with the chemistry have a proper water chemistry plan in place. Yeah. Keep the chemistry live from beginning to end. Yeah. Don't take any shortcut, as I said already. Always keep in mind the small OPEX, what you are spending towards this water chemistry, you know, for online parameters. It is going to be a prevent major shutdown and the larger OPEX of your plant. So do the proper dosing in line to the water chemistry and keep in mind all the, the parameters which we have discussed. So with that, I'll conclude my session and thank you very much for spending 45 minutes with me. And if you have any questions, it's already, I think you might have typed it. I'm waiting for my colleagues to come back with the questions. Yes, thank you so much, Kanishan. Um, very interesting and informative presentation. And lots of questions came into the chat. And please continue if you have any question. We have the goal for uh, having no question lost or unanswered. And uh, Kanishan, we can try it um, now. If you type on your, uh, on your keyboard the number one and press enter, you are back on slide number one. Um, so we can then just on your keyboard, press the number one and enter. Uh, you're back on slide number one. That's uh, the functionality of, um, of PowerPoint. Uh, can you try that now? And then we can switch over from slide to slide. Uh, just, no, no, not the whole. Just press the number one on your, on your keyboard and then enter. Mm -hmm. Good. So um, the first question is on slide number five, Ganeshan. Okay. Just press five and so enter. Should... Five and enter. Number five and enter. Okay. Oh, it's coming number, in. The, the number five. The number five on your keyboard and enter. Sorry. Five not with... Okay. We will have that uh, functionality by next time. Uh, the question is about the, the groundwater. Yeah. Okay, you said it's uh, sign number, number five, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I'm just coming back in the five, slide number five. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Um, maybe it's the four. Yeah. One back, number four. Good. Um, what is groundwater pH? Was the question from Nasha. Groundwater pH. Okay. Mm -hmm. Groundwater uh, normally, uh, definitely, it will be a you know depends on again it is depends on the soil from where whether the ground is very closer to the saline environment or it is very close to the river bed or it is very close to the uh, you know pond or something like that. So normally we cannot uh, uh, say that it, it, it can be, it depends on the, the locality where the groundwater is coming. Mm -hmm. yeah? mm -hmm. it, it changes, yeah, it changes. Okay. If I go dig the well close to the, my saline environment in the uh, sea, it will be always the close to the seawater pH. 
Okay. Yeah? Cool. But if I go and dig the water close to the lake, and it will be close to the lake water around eight, something like that. Yeah. Okay. So we cannot say the exact. It depends. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Typical values are between six and a half and eight and a half. I used to study hydrology. Yeah. That's so, what. Sorry. For exactly. That. The window is very wide. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The next question is: At the seawater inlet, do you have algae, hydro, uh, carbon, SDI analyzers in the portfolio? Hmm. Uh, the answer is no, because uh, right now uh, we do not have these parameters, mm -hmm. algae, hydrocarbon, and uh, SDI. Okay. So this Very three clear. is the, the gap in our product portfolio. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's uh, the next question. With one transmitter, you can measure all these parameters on slide number nine. You said that. Can you explain this in more details? Slide number nine. Okay. Okay. So this one, uh, when we are thinking of, uh, you know, uh, you, you have to see that uh, to make the system very simple, uh, not like, you know, a lot of pipings and the flow cell, uh, even you can have a chemistry for uh, different modules like this. Instead of this, we have alternate method where you can bring plenty of water inside. There is a flow common. This is called the uh, Backnoyer flow vessel where you can install multiple sensors and the sample inlet coming and it's going outlet and all these sensors, you know, the Anderson Dosser, we all always, you know, coming up with the the multi-parameter concept where one transmitter can handle uh, SAC sensor, DO sensor, pH and turbidity all together in one transmitter. So you will have the very compact system uh, without addition of a lot of valves and strainers and those things. And also you have the feature here, auto cleaning mechanism. Yeah. So mm -hmm. this, uh, uh, if you have a clean valve or uh, sorry, water or air, this wall can be controlled by our transmitter. It can clean the sensors, optics, because you know turbidity and SAC are optical-based sensors. It needs the, uh, the cleaning time to time. Okay, yeah. good, very so clear. This can be done from a single transmitter. Mm -hmm. uh, the next question is, do you mean pH changes with pressure? Or do you add caustic to rise the pH value if you work at higher pressure? If so, any, why? Okay. Uh, no, the thing is, uh, the pH is not changing based on the pressure. It is not, mm -hmm. it's not going okay. to change. But when the pressure, operating pressure or increasing, accordingly in the internal, the to protect that component, we need to increase the boiler water alkalinity at higher level. So that is what pH is changing. Yeah, it's not because of the the pressure. Because of the pressure, so we need to have different kind of dosing chemicals added into the boiler. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So that is what bringing up the pH, not the pressure. Okay. Then the next question is, what is the strategy for Greenfield project in order to optimize technical engineering and commercial for petrochemical plants on the owner point of view during heat stage than EPC stage? Okay. The, the question is uh, clear. The thing is, you know, uh, when it comes to uh, greenfield projects, uh, people have to spend a lot of time for uh, defining the, the engineering for, you know, the engineering, what I'm going to do for pH, I need to do it for conductivity as well. I have to do it for turbidity. But mm -hmm. when you think about this package concept, you know, one takeoff point, I'm going to measure five parameters, then, your engineering should be one engineering, not the five engineering, right? Mm -hmm. So same way you are here, you are going to talk about package, not based on the parameters. Yeah. yeah. So this mm -hmm. means it will definitely reduce your engineering cost, the man hours, 
and the way the discussion goes between the you know the vendor or user or consultant so we you are talking about packages guys this take up point yes talk about this package yeah mm -hmm. it's not the individual thing so we take care of everything the complete engineering documentation and finally it comes to you as a single product mm -hmm. so i'm sure definitely this concept uh, we, we are already applying for uh, the water packages as well as the steam packages with the swash it will it will help for end user consultant or you know epcs definitely very clear so, so you know, this is this has mm -hmm. to be uh, taken into the further step with the epcs or uh, uh, field engineering has to come up with one data sheet for the tag wise mm -hmm. same tag if they are talking about four parameters even there it has to be reduced as a single data sheet okay good very clear so ganeshan so there are many more questions even down to uh, detailed technical specific questions down to sensor technologies uh, we will answer that questions for you um, by writing you an email on that. Now, I thank you, yeah. the audience, very much for taking the time with us and uh, wish you a nice remaining day and special thank you to Ganeshan who has shared his details, his knowledge uh, gained over years with us together. Thank you so much and have a good day. Bye, Ganeshan, and thank bye to the audience. Thank you very much. You will, definitely we will compile all the questions and uh, we can circle it to the audience as a question and answer package. Super. Thank you Thanks very so much. much. Thank ciao. you very much, Oliver, you will, and all the audience yeah. around the globe. Bye-bye. Thank you. Great stuff. Bye-bye. Um.